Acts chapter 24, and we're going to be looking at the whole chapter this evening. <clears throat> Just a reminder, so Paul was sent from Jerusalem, from Claudius Lysus. He was sent to Felix. He arrived at uh, the governor of Felix's quarters and was then instructed to wait until um, those who accused him would arrive. And that's where we pick up the passage this evening. Acts chapter 24 and verse 1. And after five days, the high priest Ananias came down and some elders and a spokesman, spokesman won Tortilius, Tortilius. And they laid before the governor their case against Paul. And when he had been summoned, Tortilius began to accuse him, saying, Since through you we enjoy much peace and since by your foresight O excellent felix most excellent felix, reforms are being made for this nation in every way and everywhere we accept this with all gratitude but to the stain you know uh, uh, you know further i beg you in your kindness to hear us briefly. For we have found this man a plague, one who stirs up riots among all the Jews throughout the world, and is a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple, but we seized him. By examining, man, examining him yourself, you will be able to find out from him about everything of which we accuse him. And the Jews all joined in the charge, affirming that all these things were so. And when the governor had nodded to him to speak, Paul replied, Knowing that for many years you have been a judge over this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. You can verify that it has not been more than 12 days since I went up to worship in Jerusalem, and they did not find me disputing with anyone or stirring up a crowd either in the temple or in the synagogues or in the city. Neither can they prove to you what they now bring up against me. But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, but leaving everything laid down in the law and written in the prophets, having a hope in God, which these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. So I always make pains to have a clear conscience before both God and man. Now, after several years, I came to bring arms to my nation and to present offerings. While I was doing this, they found me purified in the temple, without any crowd or torment. But some Jews from Asia, they ought to be here to bring uh, to, to hear before you uh, and to make this uh, an accusation, should they have anything against me. Or else, let these men themselves say what wrongdoing they found when I stood before the council. Other than this one, this one thing, that I cried out while standing amongst them, it is with regard, respect to the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you this day. But Felix, having a rather accurate knowledge of the way, put them off, saying, When Lysus the tribune comes down, I will decide your case. <clears throat> 
Then he gave orders to the centurion that he should be kept in custody, but have some liberty. And none of his friends should be prevented from attending to his needs. After some days, Felix came and his wife, Drisilla, who was a Jewish, and she and he went for uh, and he sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. And as he reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment, Philip was alarmed and said, "Go away for the present. When I when I can when I get." An opportunity I will summon to you. At the same time, he hoped that money would be given him by Paul. So he sent for him often and conversed with him. Then two years later, when two years had elapsed, Felix was succeeded by Pontius Festus. And desiring to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in jail. As for the reading of our passage this evening, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you that we have the opportunity to hear your word, not once on a Sunday, but twice. And I pray, Father, that as we come to study this passage, which in a real sense, although it's not a difficult passage, it certainly has hard and difficult words and many things that we have to consider ourselves as believers. I pray, Father, that you will not only give us the understanding, but also the strength to follow the example of the Apostle Paul, even as he followed the example of Christ. Um, And we pray, Father, that you will give us uh, much wisdom as we come to study this passage this evening, because this is your word, and therefore we need your spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I think we'll be spared the severity of persecution that Paul suffered for his faith, but we have to accept that more and more Christianity becomes unpopular in this world. People look down on true Christians, and the truths and the practices that we stand for stand against, directly against, the beliefs and ways in which the people of this world walk. And they will often call us judgmental. Not so. But in reality, it's not us that's judgmental. It's their own consciousness that's bearing them witness that their way of life is not in accordance with the true and living God of all the universe. But here's the reality. There is a day of judgment coming. There is a day of judgment coming. And so while in this life we may face much persecution, perhaps not as severe as Paul had suffered, we as Christians must stand strong. When opposition comes, when persecution comes, we must not drift away from what we believe in. We must oppose. That's what the call is of our passage. The call of our passage is to follow Follow the example of the Apostle Paul. And and remember where Paul is. Paul is in jail and he's facing death. And despite that, he does not back down from proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Whatever the cost may be. What is the cost of anything that we have in this life if we have to compare it to eternity and hell? We cannot, we cannot forsake our Lord. Not only because we do, because we fear hell, because that's not the reason or the the, the reasoning behind why we do it. It is because we love the Lord Jesus Christ, because we want to live for Him. But the call of our passage then this evening is to to stand tall in the face of opposition. So, Standing tall in the face of opposition, the believer is called to stand firm even if their faith is opposed. And and I want us to look this evening at three things from our passage. The first 
thing that we can look at is the accusation. We find that in verse 1 to 9. The accusation. Now, as I have mentioned before the time, Felix received the letter from, from Claudius uh, Lysias, the, uh, the, 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 the tribune. He received the letter, and when he received the letter, he postponed the hearing of Paul until those who accused him arrived. And the passage tells us in verse 1 that it was five days later, it seems like five days later, Ananias and the elders together with uh, Tertullius, they left Jerusalem to go to Sicilia. And, and when they arrived in Sicilia, the court proceedings started. And Tertullius was a lawyer. He was the one who presented the case for the Jews. And so he was up first. And, and it was very customary, and that's exactly what he does there. It was customary at that time to praise the judge who's going to just hear your case in a few minutes' time. And so he started by praising the greatness of Felix and telling him how wonderful he is and all the wonderful things that he did. But he pushes it actually beyond the point of hypocrisy. Why do I say that? Because Tertullius comes here and he says, I praise you for the peace that you brought and for the reforms that you implemented. Where in reality, Felix was a brutal, barbaric leader who was hated by the Jews. And the only reason why Tertullius was saying these things were, was to butter him up, to get him to decide to be biased towards uh, in, in, uh, in, in favor of the Jews. That's why he did this fancy statement as he opened his address. And then he comes to the three accusations. Um, we can sum it up in three accusations that the Jews brought against Paul. The first we find there in verse 5a. And the first accusation is that they say that Paul was a troublemaker. The accusation was that Paul was stirring up riots among the Jews everywhere that he went. Now, it's important that we realize that this accusation has political overtones. This is a serious charge. Because the reality is that in those days, there were many Jews who was in fact stirring up riots all over the place, and some of them even claiming, as we know, to be Jesus Christ, to be the Messiah of the Jews. And Tertullius, oh, sorry, but and Felix was in fact the keeper of the peace, just like Tertullius had praised him only moments before. That was part of his responsibility to keep the peace. And so if Paul was disturbing the peace, then Felix would have to deal with him quite severely. But then bring, that brings us to the second charge, and that we find in the second part of verse 5. And, and the, 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 the accusation is that Paul was a ringleader of the Nazarene sect. And of course, the Nazarene sect referred to here is, of course, Christianity. So the fact is that Paul was, in fact, a ringleader of the Nazarene sect. Not so. Now, I want to add this, that it's interesting that even the Pharisees and the Sadducees were called sects in those days. So the word sects did not have the heretical overtones that it has in our day. It was simply stating that this was a grouping of people who in some area was different to others. Um, that's the only meaning of the word sect. But you can also clearly see that Tertullius' intention, his intention in, in presenting this case shows that he considers it to be heretical. In other words, he believes that Christianity is is a heretical fallacy or a lie. I want to add that that would not have been a very serious charge in the eyes of Felix, because the Romans tended to keep themselves out of internal religious conflict. So 
almost certainly he wouldn't have been too interested in this particular part of the attack. But it was important for Tertullius to show through this in some way that perhaps Paul was causing quite um, a, a bit of trouble amongst these people. And the final charge then we see in verse 6, and that is that Paul was a desecrator of the temple. Now, of course, we know this is based on a false belief, and it was unproven. And the false belief or the false claim was that Trophimus, that Paul brought Trophimus, the Ephesian, into the inner parts of the temple. That was the accusation, but we know for a fact that that was not true. And in fact, they knew that it wasn't true. And this, of course, would have been a very serious charge. Why? Because although the Romans themselves kept themselves out of religious matters, if it was true that Paul had desecrated the temple, then it would have meant that the Jews would have had jurisdiction to do with Paul as they please. And the implication is, that if Claudius Lysus intervened into a religious matter, then he was in the wrong. And there was no reason for Paul to be here, yes, but then Paul would have been handed over to the Jews. But the point is that if this was true, then, then Felix would not just disregard it. And so then... Tortelius conclude by saying, that's why we seized Paul. Now, I want you to notice, he did not tell Felix that when they seized Paul, they were in the process of trying to kill him. And that's why the Romans intervened. He doesn't tell him that. But Tortelius is trying to create this impression that the Jews were not the ones who were doing anything wrong. And furthermore, that they were quite capable themselves to handle this matter on their own. And at the same time, they're trying to give the impression that Claudius perhaps overstepped his role by intervening in this religious matter. In other words, we have the right. And Claudius was wrong. And that's why we are here today. Why we have spent all this money and traveled all the, this distance because, because he has overstepped his line. And that then is the end of his speech. But in verse 8, of course, then he appeals to, to, to Felix to examine Paul himself. And then in verse 9, the Jews affirms that all these things were so. But that brings us to the question, are these things true? And of course, we know that it's not true, but that brings us to Paul's defense in verse 10 to 21. So after Tortelius had stated his case, Paul was given the opportunity to state his side of the story. And, and as the custom of the time was, he also started by praising Felix but I want you to notice that Paul's praising of Felix is much more subdued. We find it in verse 10. This is what his praises of Felix is. Knowing that for many years you have been a judge over this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. So clearly there's no intention to impress or to bring across anything which is untrue. And then after that, Paul basically, in the next number of verses, um, from verse 11 to 21, he states his case. Firstly, with regards to the charge that he was a troublemaker, we see in verse 11 to 15 and verse 19, that Paul notes that he only arrived in Jerusalem 12 days before he was captured and arrested. So there was not enough time for Paul to start an insurrection as they claimed. And furthermore, if he stirred up a crowd at the synagogues wherever he went, uh, 
Where are those who are supposed to come and testify of those riots? Because they're not here, Paul says. They're not here. Those who say that I have stirred up the crowds, they're not here. There's no one that can testify to the things that they are claiming to be true. In other words, Paul is showing that he wasn't guilty of this charge. That there was simply no possibility for him to be guilty of this charge. But then secondly, with regards to the charge that he was the leader of the Nazarene sect, he said, yes, I am a leader of the Nazarene sect, but it's not a heretical sect. And that we find in verse 14 to 16 and also in verse 20 and 21. Paul did not deny that he was a Christian. That's important. That's very important, seeing that we have come all this way through all of these various places where Paul has been brought before various people and every single time Paul did not fail to acknowledge his Christianity. He never failed in standing up for the truth. He affirmed that he was a Christian and furthermore confirmed and affirmed that Christianity worships the true and living God. He does that in four statements. He confesses four beliefs in verse 14 to 15. Firstly, he says, I worship the God of our fathers. Secondly, he says, I believe everything as it is laid down in the law and in the prophets. Thirdly, I have placed my hope in the God who these men themselves accept as the true and living God. And fourthly, I believe in the resurrection both of the just and the unjust. Those four statements of faith, Paul here confesses. I have said it before and I'm going to say it again, that the God of the Old Testament is not the God of the new modern day Jew. The God of the Old Testament is the God of the Christian. There is only one true God, and there is only one way to the true God, and that is through Jesus Christ. And Paul's point is, I have not forsaken my religion. Even these Jews standing before you declares there is only one true God, and Paul says, that is the God that I worship. That is the God of Christianity. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy. So as he says here, the way, or as, as the, 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 the Jews had just called it, the Nazarene sect, Paul says, this is the faith in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That is the faith, the true faith in the true and living God. But you'll remember something in, in Acts chapter 23 and verse 9. I tried to make a point when we looked at Acts chapter 23 last week. Do you remember what the Pharisees declared at the end of the council's um, matter when they, they were discussing it? The, the Pharisees in the Jewish council, in the Jerusalem council, declared, we find nothing wrong in this man. And so Paul says, even these people know that there is no fault in me. And while, yes, the Sadducees did disagree on this matter, how did they disagree? It was a theological matter, not so. So it wouldn't have been anything that Felix had any concern about or that he had any jurisdiction over. So the second charge is thereby discharged. That brings us to the third charge. And that's a charge that Paul def uh, profaned the temple. And of course, Paul did not profane the temple. And that's, we see in verse 17 and 18. In fact, Paul was not profaning the temple, but Paul was purified through a ritual. 
He came to the temple to bring a sacrifice, an offering to God. And more than that, the reason why he was in Jerusalem as well was to bring the offering that was collected amongst the Gentile churches for the church in Jerusalem. So what the point is Paul is trying to make is I did not profane the temple. In fact, I did everything possible to keep the temple pure. The only reason why Paul came to the city was to, to worship the true and living God and to minister to the needy in the city. And so that brings Paul's, Paul's argument to a close. And his argument is really that the Jews have no argument. That he did not cause an insurrection or a stirrer. That indeed, yes, he was a leader of a Christian uh, of the Christian Church, but but that it was in fact part of mainstream Judaism and considered as such at that time, and that he did not profound profound the temple, but did everything that he possibly could to keep it pure. So, all of these acu accusations were false. And there was nobody here who could prove otherwise. But that brings us then to the final thing that I want us to look at. So, so Paul is stating his case very strongly that there is no case. And that brings us then to verse 22 to 27, which is the result. How did this end up? How, what was the result of this hearing? And of course, we know that there is no case here, as that Felix realized that there is no case here. How did we know? How do we know that there is no case here? How did Felix know that there is no case? Because Claudius told him, "I don't have anything to say about him. I don't know what he has done wrong." Acts chapter twenty-three and verse 20, twenty-nine. He said, "I I don't have anything to tell you about this man." The Jerusalem council did not find Jesus, uh, Paul guilty in verse 9 of Acts chapter 23. And now Tertullius has brought all these charges, but they do not hold water. And, and so the point is that Felix has nothing, once again, nothing to condemn Paul by. He is a Roman citizen in jail, uncondemned. And so logically, the only conclusion that Felix could come to is to declare him not guilty and to set him free. But he doesn't do that, does he? And why not? It's very important that we notice the reason why Felix kept Paul in jail. It is because Felix was a dishonest man. And verse 26 tells us that he wanted a bribe from Paul. But more than that, in verse 27 he also wanted to please the Jews. And so that's why he kept Paul in jail. But he did give him some freedom. And of course, he allowed Paul's friends to come and minister to him, according to verse 23. But that was because Paul was a Roman citizen, of course. And it's no doubt, I'm pretty sure that that was when Luke, who is the author of the book of Acts, actually visited Paul and got all this information. But it's also very probable that, that Philip the Evangelist and his four daughters, who was from this city, actually came to visit him. And of course, many perhaps of those in, of the local church would come and minister to Paul as he was in jail. And so for the next two years, Felix continued to conduct his own little investigation. I say that because he regularly called Paul, the passage tells us, to come and speak to them. And I think at first it becomes clear that it was under the prompting of, of Felix's wife, Drusilla, who was a Jewess, and so she had quite a bit of interest in this whole matter. But it later seems to me from the passage, it, it seems to indicate that later on Felix just asked Paul to come when Drusilla wasn't even there. Out of his own accord. 
And that brings me to what did Paul discuss with them? And the answer is the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, in particular, in verse 25, we see the thing that Paul discussed with them was what is often called the three tenses of salvation. Righteousness, self-control, and final judgment. God is a righteous God, Paul said, and you have offended Him. Therefore, you need to come to overcome your temptation and gain self-control. And the only way that you can do that is through faith in Jesus Christ because there is no other way to escape the eternal damnation that awaits you. That's the message that Paul kept on preaching and kept on preaching. Why did he discuss this with Felix? Why did he discuss this with... No name's gone now. Drusilla. Uh, Why did he continue to discuss this with him? Here's the answer. And this is important. Because Paul was more concerned about eternal matters than matters of this life. Can I put it in other words? Paul was more concerned about the salvation of those who stood before him and was his enemies than he was concerned about his own freedom from jail. That is an amazing statement. That is an amazing reality. That he was more concerned about their salvation than being set free from jail where he did not belong. And this man was the only reason why Paul was in jail. Are you concerned about the souls of those who God placed in your life? Some of them you see regularly. Some of them you only see on occasion, and some of them you might only see once in your life. But are you concerned about their salvation? Are you concerned about their souls? Because God has brought them into your life so that you will minister to them. Paul was concerned about the soul of Felix. Yes, and every time that things got too hot, Felix told him, go, go away. He chased him away. And then later on, when Paul would be able to have the opportunity to come back, he would come back and he would just take up where he left off and continue to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ once again until it got too hot. And then Felix sent him away. And then he would return again. And I know I'm not blind. Of course, Felix had ulterior motives here. He wanted a bribe. But is that not the case often in our lives that unbelievers have ulterior motives to keep us in their lives? They have other reasons why they want us in our lives. There's something else they want from us. They don't want us in our, their lives because we, we can share the gospel with them. They have other ulterior motives. But that doesn't make a difference, does not does it? Because there's an opportunity for you to seize so that you can share the gospel. And we should never stop doing that. There's one final or a few questions, but one of the important questions that perhaps on your mind is, was Felix and Drusilla ever saved? And the answer is, we are not told, but it seems from our passage that they were not saved. The reason why I say that is Felix was the governor over Caesarea for two years and by the end of the two years verse 27 tells us that he decided to keep Paul in jail to please the Jews. In other words, he was more concerned about pleasing the Jews than doing the right thing and honoring God. So there's some indication of course in our passage very clear that there was no salvation for Felix and his wife. But that doesn't mean anything, and that shouldn't discourage us. 
Why not? And this is important. It is not our call to change the hearts of men. Our responsibility is to inform the hearts of men by sharing the gospel. That's our call. It is God who changes the heart. And we must seize every opportunity we have to share the gospel, even if it comes at cost to ourselves. Paul was left in jail. But the one thing that we can say is that Paul is innocent. Claudius declared him innocent. The Jewish council declared him innocent. Tertullius could not bring a case against him. And Felix had no reason to keep him in jail except for the fact that he wanted to keep him there to have a bribe. And yet... Paul continued to minister to the very man who kept him in jail for selfish reasons. I think that tells us something about what the Lord's calling is for us, not so. I return to what we are saying this evening. Stand tall, even as we face opposition. Even if everything is against us. We cannot forsake the one who gave us his life. We cannot forsake the one who has purchased eternity for us. We must love him and love him to the end. Amen. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, it's, it's not an easy message this evening. But it is such an important message for us. And I pray, Father, that you will help us to employ, employ, employ this message and to take it to heart. And as we go into this world this week, as we start off tomorrow morning and go to work or wherever we may go, I pray, Father, that these words will haunt us, that the souls of the un, unsaved will haunt us, that we will be concerned more about their soul than our own security that we will be more concerned about these souls than our own safety. I pray, Father, help us in this. Help us to stand up for the sake of the gospel. Help us never to be ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God by which we were saved. I pray, Father, help us in this. In Jesus' name, amen.